Um, I'm Nina Callahan, and I'm the assistant director of the Children's Radio Foundation. Um, we don't do quite as sophisticated life-saving interventions <laughs> as Mark, but I do like to think that we locate lives um, in a way that can save it um, by the very people who locate their own lives. So. Um, what the Children's Radio Foundation does is use radio as a tool for learning, for dialogue, and for reflection. And we believe that young people the world over have the agency, the intellectual capacity, and the somatic sense to really make sense of their own lives, to make decisions for themselves and to express the very rich existence that is youth and childhood. So we use the medium of radio and we partner with community radio stations, with schools and with community-based organizations in five African countries, in 64 projects, and we use that partnership to create a space where young people can train in the tools of radio, where they can broadcast their stories and also engage with their communities, so that there is a nuanced dialogue led by young people about issues that are important to them and also community-focused issues that are youth-friendly and that speak to a broader youth population um, and also the community at large. So, <coughs> I think in South Africa, young people and youth have a very bad reputation. Uh, we hear about youth in the media um, of being apathetic, of being uh, not being active citizens, of not being interested in the education. But it's very interesting that the Child Gauge, which is a publication of the Children's Institute at UCT, did a media survey, and they found that young people's voices spoke for themselves in only 2% of all media. Now that's pretty shocking when we recognize that the biggest and the fastest growing demographic is youth in our country. There's no platform where youth have a legitimate voice, where children have a legitimate voice. And because they are often not able to change their material circumstance, they bear the brunt of social ills the most, yet they have no recourse in our, in our storytelling culture, right? This thing that we do on news and newspapers and online and what you have. So where we work, radio still works. It is the primary medium of news and information for most people in Africa. 85% of households in Africa have access to a radio if they don't own one. We work in Tanzania, in Zambia, in the DRC, Liberia and South Africa where we've trained over 1,300 young people to be young reporters. But we're not interested in them necessarily getting a job at the BBC. What we are interested in is nurturing and developing critical thinkers, young people who are able to evaluate information, young people who are able to engage with their communities, young people who are able to nurture confidence through being together in a training process, through staying together in a group, through also finding networks of worth within their communities. We do a very important exercise in our training because people always see their communities as places of deficit. There's nothing going on here, nothing's working. We don't have water, we don't have electricity, we don't have health services. So we do a community mapping exercise that says, if you want to do a radio show about teenage pregnancy and you live in the rural sticks, who can you talk to? Most likely, the first answer will be the clinic, the local clinic. Who at the local clinic? The nurse. What if the nurse is really busy? Who else do you speak to to get a really great 
informed radio program. And so we interrogate all of these areas and we encourage them to see pregnant teenagers who have been pregnant or are now raising children as just a valuable resource as the clinic system. So it's also about this process of making radio and engaging with community is also realizing the power of story. Why do we tell stories? We tell stories to connect. We tell stories to make sense of the world, to inspire and to inform others. So our young people make radio programs almost every week in their local languages talking about things that they want to talk about. Children's Radio Foundation doesn't have an agenda. Yes, we partner with UNICEF that has development of goals and objectives. But these kinds of issues arise naturally because they are the lived experience of our young people. So things like drug and alcohol abuse is a lived experience. Often there's one parent or both parents or a sibling where it's a problem in the household. So they go on air and they speak about the issues that are important to them. They canvass their peers at school, they tap into dialogue and conversation that's happening in their community, and they bring it home to a, with a youth perspective. Young people are trained to conduct interviews and to create radio formats. So they produce audio profiles, um, public service announcements, and they're full-on young journalists with journalistic ethics. They have to observe consent and permissions, and they go out into the communities to gather stories in a really professional manner. They come back into the studio, produce a show clock that measures second to second to second what's happening, and they go on air. They are very brave young people, exceptionally brave, and very different to what we are told youth are. I invite you as well to really take that kind of information that we fed all of the time with a huge pinch of salt because we're looking for very particular markers of what youth participation is, what is an active citizen, what is a conscientized young person, but we're missing a whole range of what is actually going on. So for us, Young people's voices and their stories are really important, not just because they are our leaders of tomorrow. That's a very common kind of default about looking at youth. They're either a problem to be solved, as we are presented them, or they are our leaders of tomorrow. But their lives, their now lives, their current lives, are without any space or platform for expression. And so for us, it's really important to create these platforms and these spaces where young people have the tools and the skills to be able to harness that and really express their lives as it is as children and young people. So for us, radio skills are life skills. You learn how to share, how to make space for others. You learn how to look into somebody's eyes without feeling threatened or being small. You can you learn to evaluate information and you also nurture confidence because you're really putting yourself out there. I think for me, one of the most important things that happen is that young people realize I actually have a story and it's a valuable story and it's worth telling and it can influence others. And that kind of sequence of understanding is a very, very powerful process that, y that happens with young people. You see when young people enter a training room, they're kind of shuffling along and they're very shy and often cultural um, uh, sensitivities inform how they pitch up in a space. Like looking in, having prolonged eye contact is, is, not, a, is not a good thing in cultures in South Africa. So we, sometimes we have to push against those kinds of things f 
to enable youth to really pitch up in a confident and um, productive way. Um, I think the latter point about realizing that you have a story and that it's valuable and that it can influence others is especially resonant in our projects at hospitals. So the Children's Radio Foundation has conducted a training at um, Red Cross Hospital um, in 2011. And we worked with a group um, of young patients and we are currently working at Brooklyn Chest Hospital, which is a tuberculosis hospital. It's a long-term facility where young people don't see their families often for up six months of up and up to a year. Many of the young patients that we've worked with have come back from the brink of death. They have had intense, an intense healing journey. Um, some of them are still not well. Uh, the young patients that we work with um, have been diagnosed with MDR and XDR TB, um, with all different kinds of TB, like um, not only respiratory TB, but spinal TB, TB meningitis, kind of all these things that I didn't know. I thought TB was about coughing when I started. <laughs> and then there was this whole world that opened up. Um, and really working with these young people is exceptionally inspiring. Um, and I think stories and storytelling should be more uh, prevalent and should be more common in spaces where young people are isolated, where they are not often consulted in the way that actually considers their opinion. I think doctors and nurses <coughs> try their damnedest to include young people in the decision making, but sometimes when you need to have an amputation, you just need to have an amputation because that's what's going to save your life. So I think in, our, in the work that we do, it's about allowing the kind of expression that isn't always possible in the consultation room um, with caregivers. Um, young people are often shut down. They're kind of locked in by family anxiety, um, unclear diagnosis, um, foreign environments, treatment regimes. And for a young person to be expressive in all of that is a huge ask. It's a really huge ask. And what we have to do is to create the conditions where story can be told. Stories don't just happen. I don't come there with a microphone and go, right, we're going to make radio today. Uh, I mean, right. What is really important is to create the conditions where young people feel safe, where you respect confidentiality, where the young people can support each other. And also, we also have to work very closely with the hierarchies within a ward. Now, this was something completely new to me, and I was thrown off guard when I first started at Brooklyn Chest Hospital. It's a long-term facility. There's a very clear picking order in that ward. There's top dog and there's the runt. <laughs> and that's how it goes. And to be able to have a sharing space where storytelling can happen, that can't happen. And it was about dismantling this hierarchy that happens in the ward to enable the story space to happen. It was incredible that young people had been living together for almost a year but they didn't know each other's stories. They weren't able to receive their fellow patient's story in a respectful way. It was about, oh, I see your medication, you HIV, mm. without having any kind of holding space, without respecting somebody's privacy. And so what we have to do in terms of introducing radio and storytelling is about creating those conditions, and that is really the core of our work, to create the condition where this can happen. Radio skills, anybody can learn it, and you can learn it in even a couple of hours. But to do this work, 
takes a very long time. But when it happens, young people are able to unlock all of those things, the anxiety to have their parents be far away and for it to be okay. Um, that's a picking order situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is, at, that is at Brooklyn Chest Hospital. When young people are able to use the microphone, they're also able to turn it on their doctors and their caregivers and their nurses. And what happens is that the microphone becomes like this baton of power. And now I am able to ask you questions. You that ask me questions. What's your temperature? How are you feeling today? Can I take some blood? Can I move your bed this way? Now they have the opportunity. Having a microphone gives young people the permission. Whether they're in a hospital or whether they're in a rural village in Limpopo, it gives them permission to ask questions. It gives them permission to say how they feel. It also unmasks their caregivers. That nastiness, she's not just the nastiness. She's also a mother. She's also somebody who actually has a sense of humor. I didn't know, I didn't know that about her. When young people are able to ask those questions and to, and to, to change the dynamic of the interaction, a whole lot of stuff can happen. So that we're not only operating as roles within an institution, our humanity can have a space to exhale and to actually be in a space in a healing space, in a more, on more equal terms. It is like cabin fever, like I can't explain to you, when I just started at Brooklyn Chest Hospital, it was like something out of Lord of the Flies, right? And, and, and it was young people who were just bouncing off the walls because of their medications. They take like 26 tablets a day, half in the morning and half at night, and that, and, and it's, it's intense medication that makes them crazy and makes them angry and makes them depressed and sad and sleepy and disorientated. And yeah, I come with my radio. <laughs> you know, so it's about a space of also exploring with the tool of radio, where are we? How can we feel more comfortable here? Did you ever really listen to the creak of the door when you opened it? <coughs> How does that make you feel? So suddenly, the ward now takes on a whole other dimension. It's a space that's alive. It's a space that can help me tell stories. I can use the sound of the trolley with all the medicine bottles rattling to explain what I feel through a simple act of just exploring the hospital environment. Radio suddenly just brought a whole new dimension to the space. But I think for the sound that's so low, it might not be a really great idea to play. Um, it was of three young patients at Red Cross. Um, one was a Burns patient, the other was a, was a renal patient, and the other was a heart, a cardiac patient. And they spoke about their journey. Um, but what I can do is share with Susan and Steve the link 
where you can watch it online on Vimeo. Um, and you're welcome to kind of browse through and have a listen to all of the fantastic young people who put themselves out there, who work really hard, um, yeah, and who locate themselves for themselves and for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here in this but I, for the past four years, I've been leading a, a research team of six postgraduate students on pediatric health. So we have a PhD that was done by Kate Abbey at Brooklyn Chess Hospital. So if anyone's interested in, in exploring some of the issues that we know raises in fact Kate and you and, and know what like closely together for all while Kate is there at Brooklyn Chess. Um, there's that thesis. So we have six postgraduate theses, honors theses, master's theses, and PhDs, all centered in different hospitals in the pediatric context around Western Cape. And all of them try to get at this relationship between the ethnographer and, and the individual who's speaking to find to do exactly this kind of work unblocking. And my sense is that radio takes it to the next step and it's a very exciting possibility to move the children's stories away from the text into a printed page and into a space like video, um, into the worlds in which children can see the into a radio where they can turn the microphone. So I find it a really exciting possibility in terms of methods for ethnography and anthropology. Um, which is not to say that ethnography doesn't also have its place. And one of the um, pieces that was done by Rosemary Blake was done here in the oncology ward. I don't know, do you remember Rose, Rosemary when she was here? <coughs> And she basically moved in to one of the rooms and uh, managed to circumvent the nasty nurse who didn't let her get into the beds with the kids. And every time that nurse was off duty, she would sneak into the bed and, 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 and literally have her head measured and different you know, medical things happening. So she tried to embody as a good, the methods of anthropology's participant observation. And so she moved in and she wrote the most gorgeous thesis which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. So that was another interlude. We now have the Mark, will you introduce yeah. who you are and thank you for being here. Oh. As much as music is for healing for, for those who need care, um, it's also an instrument for those who give care. Uh, and so part of what um, music has been for me throughout my life um, is exactly that. Um, it's been my space away from work um, to explore a whole host of things, I guess. Uh, and I've been doing it for the longest time. So the people behind me, Kristen and Lowen, are um, wonderful vocalists. And we had uh, an opportunity to do a show together two years ago and then again last year. And we're planning another one for September. And we, we're singing at Jazz in the Park on Sunday. So if you, if you want to come down and check us out, you must welcome. Um, and so one of the things that I, I wrote in January um, is a song called Teardrops. And the last year for us in this unit was particularly harrowing. Uh, we had lots of deaths in the unit, um, had several transplant patients, which did very badly. It's OK. And um, uh, it was the first year I remember um, feeling the lowest, I guess, about doing the work that I do. Um, and so the music really saved me. Sorry, <laughs> not sure where that came from. <laughs> um, and so, wow, that's really not great at all. <laughs> and so the song is, is called Teardrops, and I promise I won't cry with the song. <laughs> um, and, it's, and it's really about saying goodbye to, to things that are hurtful, about being able to step over something and bless it and accept it for what it is and to move forward. Um, <laughs> so let's hope I get to it right <laughs> after the left singer of Lovering Idiot. Okay, here goes. I hope you enjoy it. It's called Teardrops. Memorize these words, my eyes 
I'm really here. 